So, brothers and sisters, please open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew in Hebrew is Matityahu. Matityahu. Matthew chapter 1. Now, of course, recently, many of you would have seen a video teaching of mine I did about uh, the pagan origins of Christmas, how the uh, 25th of December is obviously not the birthday of Christ. It is, in fact, the birthday of the Babylonian god Tammuz, because Nimrod was, uh, as it comes from Genesis chapter 11, Nimrod built the Tower of Babel, and Babel, Babylon, there's a reason why these things are connected. All false religion goes back to Babylon. It always keeps its name of origin. So Nimrod was married to Semiramis. Nimrod died, and then Semiramis claimed that she conceived the child supernaturally in the womb by the rays of the sun. And this child was the reincarnation of Nimrod. The child's name was Tammuz, born on the 25th of December. That is where that date comes from. So it is not the birth of Christ. However, the story, the narrative of the birth of Christ comes straight from our Bible. And therefore it's very important for us to understand the theology that is in that. In Hebrew, the word for Christmas is Hag Molad. Hag Molad, it literally means the, birth, the feast of the birth or the festival of the birth, or festival of the nativity. That's the Hebrew word for Christmas. So, in the Hebrew idea for Christmas, we're looking at the nativity, the birth of Christ. That is the actual meaning of Christmas, even though it's not this time of year. Chag Molad. So in Matthew chapter 1, from verses 1 to 17, we have the genealogy of Christ. We have the genealogy of Christ through the line of David and then through the line of Solomon, which obviously is the king line, the royal line, which, of course, Matthew, Matthew's gospel, is to present Jesus as a king. Each gospel presents Jesus in one of four different ways, and Matthew's gospel is to present Jesus as the king, hence why the genealogy goes through the kingly line, the royal line. And then from verse 18... We, sorry, we're going to go from verse 18, which is then the, the narrative of the birth of Christ, the nativity, which, again, contains lots of theology that we must understand. So Matthew chapter 1, from verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Notice she was found with child, not with fetus. There is no such thing as a fetus in this thought. She was with child. Life begins at conception, doesn't it? She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to divorce her secretly. So at this point, Mary and Joseph are betrothed. They're engaged. The marriage hasn't yet been completed. And yet, it says he was minded to divorce her secretly. In the Hebrew uh, Jewish wedding model, you was considered married after the point of engagement. In other words, you needed a divorce to get out of an engagement. It's not like today where engagements can get broken off willy-nilly. You know, they get engaged and they can break off the engagement any time they like and no promise has really been broken. However, in the Jewish wedding model, an engagement was considered legally binding. You needed a divorce to get out of it. And of course, Joseph here thinks Mary has been unfaithful by the fact that she's now with child. And that's why Joseph was not wanting to make her a public example because the, the punishment for adultery, according to Deuteronomy 22, was stoning. He was put to death by stoning for adultery. Now, Joseph, being a just man, didn't want to see Mary put to death for that, even though he thinks she did wrong. Verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now the reason it says you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins, is because the name Yahushua in Hebrew literally means God is salvation, or God will save. It comes from Yahavah, or Yahweh, combined with Hoshea, 
as in Hosea, Hoshea, the same as the prophet Hosea, it literally means salvation. So Yahushua literally means God is salvation. And obviously the, the more Aramaic version of that would be Yeshua. So it literally means God is salvation. Hence you will call him Yehoshua because he will save his people from their sin. Verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold the virgin will be with child and will bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated God with us. The first thing I want to note here from verse 22 is that Matthew says this is a fulfilment of what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 right there. But he's not saying these are Isaiah's words. He's saying this was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. In other words, the words that we have in our Bibles here are God's words. A lot of people hold to this heresy called red letter theology, which is basically only the words of Jesus are God's words. They don't like the rest of the Bible, which teaches all kinds of, you know, against homosexuality, against all the things that the world now loves. And therefore, the way around that is, oh no, only the words Jesus spoke are God's words. Now, the words Jesus spoke are God's words, absolutely. But 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is inspired by the, word, by, by the Spirit of God. And therefore, Matthew here is telling us that these words spoken by Isaiah were well, not Isaiah's words. They were the words spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And as I said, it's quoting Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is a proof text we often use to prove to people that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. Now, when it comes to unbelieving Jews, you do need to be careful because the Hebrew text here, the, the word for virgin in Hebrew is not used. The word for virgin in Hebrew is betulah, betulah. But it's not the word that is used in Isaiah 7.14. My dad explained this last week when he spoke about the book of Isaiah. The word in the Hebrew there, the virgin, is alma. It's not betula, it's alma. Now alma, literally translated, means a young unmarried woman. The closest equivalent we'd have in English is probably damsel. A damsel, a young unmarried woman. So the rabbis today would say, it's not talking about a virgin, it's just talking about a young unmarried woman. Well, there's three main problems with this idea. First of all, it says the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. What sign is there in a woman conceiving a child naturally? It happens all the time. The reason the human race exists today is because of natural conceptions. It happens all the time. There's no sign in that whatsoever. There's no miracle in that, is there? Secondly, you have what's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek version of the Old Testament. About 200 years before the time of Jesus, the rabbis translated the Old Testament into Greek. Because Hebrew at this point was pretty redundant. They didn't really speak Hebrew that much after the Babylonian captivity. So around the time of Jesus, they went by the Septuagint, translated into Greek. It's handy to know these translations because it tells you what the ancient rabbis believed about the scriptures. One of the things we see in the Septuagint in Isaiah 7.14 is that they translated the word Alma, Parthenos. Again, my dad explained this last week. Parthenos. And it is the Greek word for virgin. It's where we get the word Parthogenesis from. So we understand that the ancient rabbis knew that the Messiah was to be conceived by a virgin. They knew this. And the third main problem is what my dad also explained last week, is that in the culture of the time, in first century Israel, an Alma, a young unmarried woman, would have been a virgin. They would have been a virgin. Again, it's not talking about Clacton in 2022. It's talking about Israel in the first century. An Alma would have been a virgin. And as I said, you can prove from the ancient Jewish literature and the translations of the scriptures that the ancient rabbis understood about the miraculous conception of the Messiah. How did they understand that? Well, they understood it from the number of miraculous conceptions that you see in the Old Testament. For example, Abraham and Sarah. They miraculously conceived Isaac. 
They were past the age of conception, and yet the Lord miraculously gave Sarah conception and conceived a child, Isaac, which means laughter. You also have Rachel and Jacob. Rachel was barren, wasn't she? Now, being barren in this culture, in Hebrew thought, you was considered cursed. If you was barren, if you could not conceive a child, then you was bringing shame upon your family name. You was considered cursed if you was barren. But the Lord miraculously opened up Rachel's womb and gave her conception. And uh, Rachel and Jacob conceived Joseph. Again, it's all to foreshadow the conception of the Messiah. You also have the example of Samson. Samson was conceived miraculously by Manoah and Manoah's wife, who was unnamed. They uh, miraculously conceived Samson. Then you have also Elkanah and Hannah, who miraculously conceived Samuel from 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah was barren, but she prayed and the Lord gave her conception and they conceived Samuel. You also have then the New Testament example, of course, of Elizabeth and Zacharias, who conceived John the Baptist. All these miraculous conceptions that you see in the Bible are to foreshadow the miraculous conception of the Messiah. They teach us how the Messiah will be conceived and born. Let's continue, verse 24. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife. And he did not have sexual relations with her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now this refutes one of the Catholic heresies, which tells us that Mary remained a virgin all her life. The Catholics believe that Mary was a virgin all her life, because they want to portray her as being sinless and perfect and divine. It tells us right here that she did not have sexual relations until, what does the word until mean? if she didn't have sexual relations after Jesus was born. And then we know that she went on to have other children. It says in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, that Jesus had other brothers and sisters. So we know that Mary did not remain a virgin her whole life. No sin in that whatsoever. But it's not true. It's not true what the Catholics say about Mary. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. She did not have sexual relations until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's go into chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Christ is basically Mashiach. Christ is is Messiah in Greek. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the, the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So Herod here is asking the chief priests and the scribes, where is the Messiah to be born? And they go straight to Micah, the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. Now, of course, first thing to note here is that there's nothing in Scripture which is not there purposely. It is always there for a reason. The reason it tells us Bethlehem Ephrata is because there are two Bethlehems in the land of Israel. You also have a Bethlehem in the north, in the, ter- in the territory of Zebulun, but there's also the Bethlehem in the south, in the land of Judah. Ephrata would be the, the region that Bethlehem is like saying Clacton in Tendering. So it tells us which Bethlehem is talking about. It can't be the other one. Secondly, There's a big problem here for the rabbis who believe that the Messiah has not come yet. This tells us the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. It's talking to Bethlehem as a person. It's personifying Bethlehem, saying, out of you will come forth a ruler, one who will rule my people Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. So Bethlehem is now a Palestinian-controlled city. 
There hasn't been a Jew born in Bethlehem for decades and probably never will be again. The rabbis have a massive problem. If the Messiah is Jewish, which we know he is because it's foretold in the Bible, then he has to be born in Bethlehem. But what the rabbis will say now is, oh no, but that's not a messianic prophecy. It's not talking about the Messiah. It's always their get out card. Oh, that verse, no, it's not talking about the Messiah, it's talking about something else. When Herod asked the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes, where is the Messiah to be born? They went straight to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and they quoted that. The ancient rabbis all understood this passage to be talking about the Messiah. It's the rabbis today who are lying to us and telling us something different. That's why we need to be familiar with ancient Jewish literature and translations of the Old Testament because it tells us what the rabbis at that time believed. The rabbis before the time of Jesus believed something very different to what the rabbis today would tell you. Why? Because they don't want to accept that Jesus is the Messiah. Everything the rabbis tell you today is all geared around getting around the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Because if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah in Judaism, you're cursed. You're cursed, you're shunned from the community. And secondly, it tells us that the Messiah is eternal, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. Now the Jews just believe that the Messiah is simply a man who will just come and conquer and get rid of Israel's enemies and reign on David's throne. That's correct. But we know as believers in the Messiah that he's much more than that. He's literally God in the flesh who first came to pay for our sin and who's going to return to destroy all evil. He was God in human form. And the Jews will tell you that the idea of the Messiah being divine is not a Jewish idea. However, we know from various other passages that we'll look at shortly that the Old Testament, not the New Testament, but the Old Testament describes the Messiah as being eternal and divine whose going forths are from old, from everlasting. It tells us that the Messiah exists eternally. Let's continue in verse 7. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Now we know, of course, that he wasn't planning on worshipping the Messiah, he was planning on killing the Messiah. Herod wanted to be king and didn't want any other king threatening his throne. So he's planning to kill the Messiah. Herod here is a type of the Antichrist. If you want to know what the Antichrist is going to be like and what he's going to do, then you look at people like Herod. These wicked men in the Bible are foreshadowings and pictures of the Antichrist, the last one. They will teach us what the Antichrist will be like. Now, Herod here is pretending that he wants to go and worship the Messiah. The Antichrist is going to pretend to be one of us. The Antichrist is going to be so powerful. Remember, Jesus was God in the flesh. The Antichrist is going to be Satan in the flesh. The Antichrist is going to have the power to be all things to all people. He's going to have the power to make everyone say he's one of us. So all the false Christians out there are all going to say, this man, he's one of us. They're going to say, what a mighty man of God he is. What a man of peace. What a, man, what a loving man of compassion he is. I remember when Jeremy Corbyn was running for Prime Minister three years ago. Praise the Lord that he lost miserably. All the people were saying, what a loving man. What a man of peace. What a disaster that would have been if he'd have got elected. That's exactly what the Antichrist is going to be like. People are going to be defending him, sticking up for him, singing his praises when in fact he's Satan incarnate. Something else about Herod was that he was ethnically an a, um, Idumean, an Edomite. He was actually one of the last of the Edomites. So he was a, an Arab ethnically. But religiously he was a Jew. He was a practicing Jew religiously. Politically he was in bed with the Romans. So he was a Roman politically, he was a Jew religiously, and he was an Arab ethnically. Again, he was all things to all people. They're all going to say, he's one of ours. And that's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. Verse 9. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. 
When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now these gifts all have meanings. They're all very significant as to why these wise men have bought these particular gifts. They're not just random things here that have been bought for him. They all have meanings. The gold, for example, we all know has to do with being a king. Again, Matthew presents Jesus as a king. Gold is for a king. There's no king in the Bible associated with gold more than King Solomon. It says uh, that when Solomon was king, there was so much gold around that it, that silver basically was worthless because it was just gold everywhere. So gold is for his kingship. Frankincense, that's for a priest. Incense has to do with being a priest, doesn't it? It was a priestly duty to burn the incense on the altar. We see that from Exodus chapter 30. And that's what Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was doing in the temple when the angel visited him. So the frankincense is because Christ will be a priest. Gold, because he'll be a king. And frankincense, because he'll be a priest. Hebrews 6.20, he has become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, something we must remember before we look at the myrrh is that you either had a priest or a king. You couldn't be both. You had a priest and a king. The king could not be a priest and the priest could not be a king. The king was from the line of David, of the tribe of Judah, and the priest was from the line of Aaron in the tribe of Levi. You could not be both. There was a very, very good reason why you could not be both. The reason is, is because only the Messiah is both. Only the Messiah is a king and a priest. Remember the story of King Uzziah. King Uzziah was a very popular king from 2 Chronicles 26. He was the king, one of Israel's longest reigning kings, very popular king, very righteous king. But because of his pride, he wanted to enter the temple to burn the incense, didn't he? He wanted to perform a priestly duty. So the priest ran in after him and said, get out, this isn't your job. They're talking to the king of Israel here. They're saying, get out, this is not your job to burn the incense before the altar. And because of Uzziah's pride, the Lord struck him with leprosy, didn't he? And he remained in what was effectively quarantine for the rest of his reign because of his pride. It was an abomination for him to enter the temple to burn the incense. Why? Because a king cannot be a priest and a priest cannot be a king. Why? Because only the Messiah is a king and a priest. Can anyone think of an example of a man who claims to be a king and a priest? The Pope. The Pope is of course considered to be the head of the Catholic Church, a priest, a high priest, and he's also the king of Vatican City. The Vatican City is its own country. We've been there. Vatican City is an independent country. And the king of Vatican City is the Pope. He is a king and a priest. Why? Because he's a type of the Antichrist. Remember, anti in Greek does not mean against. When we say, I'm against this, I'm anti that, I'm anti this, I'm anti that, but in Greek thought, anti means in place of. That's why the Antichrist is called the Antichrist, because it's a man who will take the place of Christ. It's exactly what the Pope does. He calls himself a king and a priest. Well, that's Antichrist, because there is only one king and priest, and that's Jesus, isn't it? When a Catholic priest says, your sins are forgiven, my child, this is Antichrist. When the Pope calls himself the head of the church, this is Antichrist. There's only one head of the church, isn't there, brothers and sisters? What's his name? Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is the head of the church, which we know from Colossians and Ephesians. So when someone calls themselves a king and a priest, this is Antichrist. This is blasphemy. 1 John chapter 2 says that the Antichrist is coming, but many Antichrists have already come. There are many Antichrists. There are many who try to take the place of Christ. Mohammed is an antichrist, claims to be the greatest prophet of all time. Jesus is the greatest prophet of all time. Let's move on to the myrrh. We've had the gold for a king, the frankincense for a priest. Myrrh, 
called myrrh, as I've explained many times, relates to death. Myrrh was anointing for burial. That is why the myrrh, because he was to die. He was a king and a priest who was going to come and die for the sins of the people. Myrrh always relates to death. In John chapter 19, verse 39, when they came to anoint the body of Jesus, Nicodemus, they brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes. Myrrh was used for anointing for burial. In Song of Songs, chapter 5, I spoke about the bride who wasn't ready. Remember the bride who had took off her garment, who wasn't ready when the groom came knocking? She eventually went to answer the door and her hands were dripping with myrrh, wasn't it? Because she's anointed for burial, because she wasn't ready. So myrrh in the Bible has to do with death. Gold for a king, frankincense for a priest, and myrrh for his death. That's why those three gifts in this story. Let's move on to verse 12. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So basically they've outsmarted Herod here. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, so I take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. Now this is very interesting because he's quoting Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 right there. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. This is how we must understand Jewish prophecy. What Hosea is talking about there in chapter 11 is Israel living in Egypt. And then God rescued Israel from Egypt, bringing them through the Red Sea into the Promised Land. That's what it's talking about there. But then Matthew quotes this verse when Jesus was taken out of Egypt back into the Promised Land, back into his homeland. So he's taken a verse which was meant for the nation of Israel and he's applied it to the Messiah. In other words, it has that parallel meaning. Not a contradictory meaning, by no means. It has a parallel meaning. It has a near fulfilment and a far fulfilment. A present fulfilment and a future fulfilment. So Hosea is, di is directly talking about Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Talking about Israel coming out of Egypt through the Red Sea. But then Matthew takes that verse and says that when Jesus was rescued from Egypt to come back to his homeland, out of Egypt I called my son. That's how we must understand these prophecies. Amen. Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So basically he wants to get rid of the Messiah, he doesn't want another king coming to threaten his throne, so he's now had all the baby boys, two years or under, in Bethlehem, destroyed. Now Herod, it was said by the historians, had paranoid schizophrenia. He was really, really unpredictable, you could say. He had one of his wives executed and he had three of his sons executed because he thought they were all trying to conspire against him. So they say that he had paranoid schizophrenia. As I said, Herod is a type of the Antichrist. He teaches us about the Antichrist. This is the sort of thing the Antichrist is going to do, isn't it? And we see this sort of thing as well in other passages in the Bible. Being deceived and then taking out their anger by having those exterminated. For example, Pharaoh. Pharaoh had all the baby boys wiped out in Exodus chapter 1. Because he thought Israel was becoming too large. Too many of them. So he said to the Hebrew midwives, drown all the uh, baby boys when they're born. But there was one who was rescued, wasn't there? Moses. It's a picture of Christ, isn't it? Being rescued from Bethlehem to be in Egypt. You also have Haman, when Mordecai, in the book of Esther, when Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. What did Haman say? Have all the Jews exterminated, wipe them all out. 
the book of Esther chapter 3. You also have the example of Queen Athaliah from 2 Kings chapter 11. Queen Athaliah was the mother of King Amaziah. When Amaziah died, his mother had put to death all the royal descendants, her grandchildren, because she wanted to take the, the throne for herself. Athaliah actually was one of the daughters of Ahab and Jezebel. So what is the devil trying to do here? He's used Pharaoh to wipe out the baby boys. He's used Haman to try and exterminate the Jews. He's used Athaliah to try and get rid of the royal line. What's the devil trying to do? He knows that the Messiah is coming. He's trying to prevent the coming of the Messiah. He knows that there is a Messiah coming who is going to destroy the devil. Now this goes back to Genesis chapter 3. This goes back to the enmity between the serpent and the woman. Between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. It all goes back to Genesis chapter 3. You shall crush his heel, but he will crush your head. There's so much you can go into about this, we won't digress too much. But the, the devil knows that there is a Messiah who's going to come and crush his head. He knows that his time is short, and therefore he's trying to prevent the coming of the Messiah. We're going to speak about this a bit more in our Hanukkah service next week. He knows that the Messiah is coming, and he's trying to prevent the coming of the Messiah. Why? Because he knows that the Messiah comes from the Jews. He knows that the Messiah comes from the line of David. When Queen Athaliah had the royal descendants put to death, it was because he, the devil knows that the Messiah comes from the line of David. But there was that one boy snatched away, wasn't there? His auntie, Yehoshiba, she snatched him away, Joash. That's a picture of Jesus being rescued from Bethlehem to preserve the life. And of course, Yehoshiba rescuing Joash is to preserve the royal line because the Messiah comes from the line of David. Now this is all summed up in Revelation chapter 11. Where you have the woman who is a picture of Israel. The woman is Israel. The 12 stars. It all goes back to the vision from Genesis 37 of Joseph. She brings forth the man-child. But what happens to the man-child? The man-child is caught up to heaven. It's a picture of Jesus being rescued, isn't it? The man-child is caught up to heaven. But then the dragon pursues the woman. The dragon pursues the woman, but the earth protects the woman. So what does the dragon do? Satan is cast down to heaven. We'll read Revelation 12 from verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to a place where she is to be nourished for a time, times and half a time. Three and a half years, that is. From the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. So it's an apocalyptic summary of what happened with Herod, with Pharaoh, with Haman. He went to make war against the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what Herod did, what Pharaoh did, is what the Antichrist is going to do. When the Antichrist reveals his true colours, when the Antichrist breaks that covenant, He's going to go after God's people and try and wipe them out. It's a picture. It's all foreshadowed by these stories. Now, of course, Satan using these wicked men to wipe out these babies hasn't gone away, hasn't it? It hasn't gone away because it's not happening in the River Nile anymore. It's not happening in Bethlehem. It's happening in every maternity ward, in every hospital in the world, isn't it? The Democrats who want to abort babies all the way up to nine months because they have the spirit of Herod and they have the spirit of Pharaoh. Baby murderers. And those who vote for them are just as wicked. <clears throat> Let us continue in verse 17. So Herod has gone after the babies in Bethlehem, had the babies destroyed. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by, the, by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted 
because they are no more. So this is quoting Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15. Jeremiah here is talking about the Babylonian captivity again. But now Matthew applies this to what happened in Bethlehem. He's talking about the destruction of the, ch of, of the children when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem. It says they put to death everybody. But now Matthew applies this to what happened in Bethlehem with Herod. Verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now this passage in uh, Matthew 22 here, sorry, in Matthew 2, verse 23, has had many Bible scholars and expositors scratching their heads, because it says it was a fulfilment of what was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. There is no prophecy in the Old Testament which says that he will be a Nazarene. There's no prophecy in any uh, apocryphal books either which says about the Messiah being a Nazarene. So why does Matthew say that this Jesus dwelling in Nazareth is a fulfilment of what the prophets said, he shall be called a Nazarene? To the best of my understanding, and many other Bible expositors as well, this is a pun, a play on words. There are many play on words in the Bible. There's quite a few different puns. You only see it in the original Hebrew and Greek. You don't see it in English. But there are many puns that are used. Because there's passages in the Old Testament which refer to the Messiah as a branch. The branch in Zechariah chapter 3 and chapter 6, uh, Isaiah 11 and Jeremiah 23. The Messiah is called a branch. Now the word for branch in Hebrew is netzer. Netzer. The word for Nazarene in Hebrew is Netzri. Netzri. It's pretty much the same word, just a very, very slight difference. So, to the best of my understanding, it's saying he will be called a branch. He will be called a Netzer, but it's slightly changing it to Netzri. He will be called a Nazarene. And that, of course, is in the uh, Old Testament. As I said, Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, these passages which say that the Messiah will be a branch. So to the best of my understanding, that is what that passage is talking about. He shall be called a Nazarene, a branch. Now one of the things that I've explained before, of course, is that Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. What we've just studied right here in Matthew 1 and 2, this did not take place in December. When did it take place? Well, we can narrow it down to two weeks. We know in 1 Chronicles chapter 24 that David here is establishing schedules for the priests. You basically have Aaron, the high priest. He had four sons. Two of those sons were killed, were destroyed because they burnt the wrong incense in the temple. That happened in Leviticus 10. So it leaves Eleazar and Ithamar, two sons of Aaron. They had 24 children between them. 24 sons, I should say. 24 priests. And based on these 24 priests, in 1 Chronicles 24, they're going to establish what they call divisions. Divisions. In other words, each of them is going to serve for a two-week period throughout the year. You have 24 priests, 12 months of the year. That means they serve for two weeks. So if you was a Levite or a priest, you served for two weeks every year. Not a bad job where you get two weeks work and 50 works paid holiday. But that's how it worked. You basically served for two weeks in the year when your division was due to serve. 24 divisions, 12 months. Starting, of course, from the first month, which, of course, is Nisan. The month of Nisan is the first month. The key verse here in 1 Chronicles 24 is verse 10. When they drew the lots, the seventh lot fell to Hakoz, and the eighth lot fell to Abijah. Abijah is the key one here. 
the eighth lot. So the eighth lot means that Abijah is going to serve in the last two weeks of the fourth month. You will follow. It's the last two weeks of the fourth month. The fourth month in Hebrew is Tammuz. It's nothing to do with the, uh, the Babylonian, well, it is named after the Babylonian god, Tammuz. All the Hebrew months eventually took on Babylonian names. They were originally first, second, third month, etc. But after the Babylonian captivity, they took on Babylonian names. And the fourth month is a month of Tammuz, unrelated to the fact that the 25th of December is the birthday of Tammuz. That's unrelated. So the fourth month, Tammuz, Abijah is serving in the last two weeks of the fourth month. We then go to Luke chapter 1, where we see this guy, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. Nothing is in scripture by accident, as I've said before. It tells us that Zacharias was of the division of Abijah. Remember, these schedules are supposed to be continuous. They continue on. This tells us that Zacharias here is serving in the temple in the last two weeks of the fourth month. This would have been the last two weeks of the fourth month. The division of Abijah. His wife was the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they both were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that whilst he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, so there you go, it's the division of Abijah that is serving in the temple during this time, which would have been the last two weeks in the month of Tammuz, the fourth month. According to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Again, burning incense was a priestly duty. Now we know from verses 23 and 24 that Elizabeth would have conceived her child in the last two weeks of the, of the month of Tammuz, the last two weeks of the fourth month. This is when Elizabeth conceived John the Baptist. We also know from verses 26 and 36 that Elizabeth's pregnancy was six months more advanced than Mary's. So when Mary was told she was going to conceive a child, Elizabeth was already six months pregnant. What do you do then? You add six months to nine months. Basic maths, five-year-old child could do this. Six months to nine months, 15 months, from the fourth month of the year. Now the month of Tammuz, I should add, corresponds roughly to the end of June or beginning of July to our Gregorian calendar. So you're in approximately the end of June, beginning of July, you add 15 months to that, six months for Mary's pregnancy, sorry, six months for Elizabeth's pregnancy, and nine months for Mary's pregnancy. 15 months, it brings you out to the seventh month the following year. So a whole year and then the seventh month, which is the month of Tishrei in the Hebrew calendar, corresponding roughly to our end of September, beginning of October. This is when Jesus would have been born, 15 months on from when Zacharias was serving in the temple, 15 months on, which brings you out to the month of Tishrei, the seventh month, corresponding to the last week in September or the first week in October. This is when Jesus would have been born. And you have to go on the assumption that um, Mary's pregnancy was a full nine months. However, it's no assumption at all because it does tell us in, uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 6, that Mary had completed the full term of her days, that her days of delivery had been completed. So Mary, you know, Jesus was not born prematurely. She completed a full nine months of pregnancy. As I said, this means that he'd have been born in the last week of September or the first week of October. What that means is, is that he would have been born during the Feast of Tabernacles. I spoke about the Feast of Tabernacles recently, as we had it two or three months ago. This is when Jesus would have been born. It's quite fitting that the Messiah should be born during the Feast of Tabernacles, because it says in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek word there is eskozin, which literally means to tabernacle among us. There's some Bible translations which say the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So it's only fitting that the Messiah should be born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Unfortunately, we can't narrow it down any closer than that, but we know it would have been 
the two week window, the last week in September or the first week of October. This is when Jesus would have actually been born. It also explains why there was no room at the inn. You know, the story where there's no room at the inn. Pilgrims coming from all over the Middle East to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Right now you have the World Cup in Qatar. Try and get a hotel room in Qatar right now. You won't, because they're all full. It's the same back then. Pilgrims coming from all over the Middle East to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. The inns and the taverns would have been full. That explains why there was no room at the inn on the way to uh, Jerusalem. Now, what's more important than when he was born is why he was born. The reason the Bible doesn't tell us when he was born exactly is because it isn't important. We know it's not the 25th of December. We know it's roughly the end of September, beginning of October. But the reason it's not in our Bibles is because it's not important. What is in our Bibles is why he came. Why is it in our Bibles? Because it's important. We must know why he came. They didn't know why he came the first time. They weren't ready for his coming. How many people were ready for the first coming of Christ? Hardly any. A small remnant, a small percentage of people were ready for the first coming. And that's why he was rejected, according to John uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 11. His own people received him not, but to as those who did receive, to them he gave them the right to become children of God, who believed in his name, the Gentiles. So the gospel went to the Gentiles because his own people rejected him. And now how many are ready for his return? Hardly any. A small remnant, a small percentage. The church is asleep. The church is not ready for his return. Why? Because it replays what happened. This is why we must understand these stories in our Bibles. They teach us about what will happen. If you want to know what will happen, you look at what did happen. The Jews weren't ready for Christ's first coming and the church is not ready for his return. And the reason that there's people who are not ready for his return is because they are the same as those who weren't ready for his first coming. Those who are not ready for his return, if they lived 2,000 years ago, they wouldn't have been ready for his first coming either. We have people today who call themselves Christians who don't understand why he came the first time, let alone the second time. They go around saying, yeah, Jesus came to, to show us love. Jesus came to teach us how to love and to show compassion to others. And that's why we must spread love to other people. Did Jesus came to bring compassion? Yes, he did. Of course he did. But that wasn't the purpose of his coming. Did Jesus come to love us and to show us how to love? Yeah, of course he did. But that wasn't the purpose of his coming. Let us clarify this, brothers and sisters. The first coming, the reason was to atone for your sin and for mine. It was to make blood atonement for our sin. That is why Jesus was born. That is why he was given the myrrh at his birth. It was to make blood atonement for your sin and for mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some people say Jesus came to bring peace. Oh, he came to bring peace. Jesus said in Luke 12, 51, I have not come to bring peace. I've come to bring division. Division between father and son, between brother and sister, between mother and daughter. I've come to bring division. He will bring peace when he returns. When he returns, he will come to bring peace and judgment. He's not coming to bring compassion and forgiveness anymore. He's now coming to bring judgment and everlasting peace. Now, because Jesus didn't fulfill those prophecies about the conquering king who will come and overthrow Israel's enemies and bring eternal peace, because he didn't fulfill those prophecies, the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, say that we have now had to invent a new job description for the Messiah. They say Christians now have had to invent this idea that the Messiah comes to pay for our sin first and then returns. Well, it's not a Christian invention whatsoever. The ancient rabbis understood the same sort of idea. Again, I must emphasize this is why we must be familiar with ancient Jewish literature. There's an ancient rabbi called Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi, who in the Talmud, he notes that there are two different pictures of the coming of the Messiah from the Old Testament. He notes that in Daniel chapter seven, the Messiah comes in glory on the clouds. But then he says also that in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, the Messiah comes humbly on a donkey in fulfillment, well, which is fulfilled at the triumphal entry in Matthew 21 and Luke 19, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. Two pictures of the coming of the Messiah. The ancient rabbis knew this. They knew about this. 
It's the rabbis today who are lying to us. It's the rabbis today who tell us something very different. Remember when Jesus was reading from the scroll of Isaiah? In Luke chapter 4, he was in the synagogue in Nazareth, reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, which we looked at last week in our study of the book of Isaiah. He read Isaiah 61, he said, The Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind, to set free the captives to those who are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. He didn't read on. If he had read on, he'd have also read, and the day of vengeance of our God. Why didn't he read on? Because that wasn't the purpose of his first coming. That will be accomplished when he returns to bring the day of vengeance. That's why he closed the book halfway through a verse, and then everyone was staring at him in amazement. Why? Because he didn't read the whole thing. He closed the book halfway through a verse. And we know, not just from the Old Testament, but from the New Testament as well, that Jesus came to atone for our sin. He came to redeem us from the curse of sin, but he will then return to bring judgment and then everlasting peace. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. He's come to deal with our sin, and then he's coming back to redeem us, but to also judge the world. So he came as a high priest, but he's returning as a king. He came as a lamb, but he's returning as a lion, isn't he? He came as a servant, but he's returning as a conqueror. He came as the redeemer, but he's returning as the avenger. He came as the sacrifice, but then he's returning as the judge. Yes, he came to bring compassion. He came to bring forgiveness, but he's not returning that way, brothers and sisters. He's coming now to judge all evil, to judge those who have rejected him and for those who have continued in their rebellion against God. Only a tiny remnant of people understood about the first coming of Christ, and it's going to be exactly the same when he returns. Only a tiny remnant of people are going to understand about his return. Daniel 12.10 says... The wicked will not understand, only the wise will understand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us give thanks in prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us together. And we thank you for these amazing lessons that are in your word concerning the birth of your dear son. We thank you, Lord, that whenever it was he came 2,000 years ago, not to bring judgment, but to bring forgiveness and compassion and redemption. But we thank you, Lord, that he is returning to bring judgment and then everlasting peace. We thank you, Lord, that as believers in your dear Son, that we have that inheritance in your kingdom, that we are going to reign with him as kings and priests. And we thank you, Lord, that we no longer have to be worried about the curse of sin because you have taken that curse upon yourself when you wore that crown of thorns and took the abuse and the beatings and the nails ultimately and you took the death that we deserve we thank you Lord that you have given us the free gift of eternal life and we thank you Lord that when you came all those years ago that you knew us already that you loved us already Lord and that you shed your blood for us and gave up your life for us. We thank you, Lord, for redeeming us, and we thank you for transferring us out of the kingdom of hell and transferring us into the kingdom of heaven. And we thank you now that you've raised up a remnant, an army of saints who are ready for your return, who are ready for your second coming. And help us to always keep our eyes open, help us to be sober, help us to be alert, and help us to proclaim the good news to others whilst there is still time. We do thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit which teaches us all things. But we thank you for our Saviour, our King, our High Priest, our Lord and Saviour, Yeshua HaMashiach, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Praise the Lord.